Hello, uh, welcome to the RTS Masterclass, of Daytime and Entertainment. Uh, my name is Matt Pritchard. Um, please do get involved with this session. Um, during the session, you can use the chat box below the video to chat, comment, or ask a question. Um, you can pop out the chat by clicking the three dots in the top right corner of the chat box. So this is a masterclass on daytime and entertainment. The two do go together. I was um, lucky enough to spend a year in daytime and I spent most of my career in entertainment. And the thing that connects the two of them is that basically, if you can work in daytime TV, you can literally work in any genre of television, especially entertainment. Um, the reason being that if you get into daytime TV, however you get in and whatever job you do, there are so many aspects of traditional television that you cover that it is such a brilliant training ground. So if you want to go into talent, you deal with talent. If you want to go into working behind the cameras, there's lots of opportunities in studios or there's opportunities on location. If you want to go into the legal, the tech, and of course, if you want to go into production, then you get incredible amounts of experience in terms of storytelling, working with talent, daily editorial meetings. And actually, at the end of the day, all of this comes together to make a show that you do it one day, you put it to bed and you get up the next day and you make it better. Genuinely, there is nothing else in television anymore that allows you to do as much. And that's why daytime is such an exciting area. And we're very lucky to be talking to, I mean, technically the queen of daytime. So it's Emma Gormley who uh, runs daytime for ITV. Um, Emma's responsible for four daytime shows, which run from 6 a.m. in the morning to 1.30 p.m in the afternoon on ITV. That's Good Morning Britain, Lorraine, This Morning, Loose Women. And that's seven and a half hours of television every single day, which is uh, around uh, 2,000 hours a year. I'm sure Emma will correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, Emma's been in this role for six years. Before this role, she was editor of The Lorraine Show and deputy editor of GMTV. So what we're gonna do is talk to Emma about her career, her long established career. And along the way, we're just going to learn exactly what it takes to uh, work in daytime and how to work your way to the top. So hello, Emma. Hi, Matt, lovely to see you and good to see everyone. Well, I can't see you, but it's really nice that you're all there. So thank you for attending. <laughs> for attending. Well, I just Absolutely. thought that probably the best the best thing to do is to um, just start kind of right at the beginning in terms of how you got into the job you're doing today. Yep, sure. So, um, so I think I'd always really wanted to uh, work in television or work in the media. I wasn't really sure what role to do or um, I didn't know anything about it really, if I'm honest. I just thought it looked really good fun, quite glamorous. Uh, and exciting actually so um, so I did a degree I went to Manchester Poly which um, is now called Manchester Metro um, so I went there I did an English and history degree um, and when I was there I, um, I I sort of did quite a lot of work experience so I used to work at the BBC if it was children in need um, I used to help them out there um, I did various stints on um, local radio there so uh, uh, GMR um, I did um, quite long stints on the breakfast show. Um, when I say on the breakfast show, I was making the tea, uh, running around, photocopying. Yeah, tea making is really important. I'm sure we'll get back to that. Um, I'm still making the tea. Um, and, um, uh, and, and answering phones and doing all of that kind of thing. So I used to sort of try and, you know, do, do as much work experience. And I went to Granada and did some... Um, you know, at one stage, I'm, I'm sort of vaguely interested in sport, um, but not enough. Um, and I went to Granada and did some um, sports uh, shadowing there. Um, so kind of, you know, tried to do as much there as I could. Um, and then um, finished in Manchester. Um, and kind of by that stage thought I really want to be uh, a TV researcher, but I've got a degree. But actually, I don't, you know, how am I going to get in? So uh, I worked for a year, had a year out to um, save up, to pay some overdraft before I started my next overdraft. 
um, uh, and uh, then got into um, uh, Preston, which is uh, at the time, well, it's UCLan now, so it's University mm -hmm. of Central um, Lancashire in Preston. And I got into the postgrad uh, broadcast journalist uh, uh, course. So there are about 25 people. Um, I'm not sure if it's still the same these days. It was, it was quite hard to get into. Um, you spend a day being interviewed and then you're whittled down and hopefully you, you're there by the end of the day. And thankfully I was. Um, so I spent a year there training to be a journalist, training to be a radio reporter, really. That's the skill. So yeah. it, was, it was a vocational skill. And, and did you find, did you, even at that stage, did you feel that journalism was the way you wanted to go or, or where was your head? Did you, did you kind of keep your options open? Yeah, I just, I was just really conscious that I had a degree um, and I wasn't, I didn't really have any sort of tangible skills. So I just thought if I did, if I did a course like that, at the end of it, I was going to be a trained radio reporter and I could actually physically then go into radio stations make packages, you know, read the news, do all of that kind of thing. So I was quite conscious about not having any sort of um, skill set, really. Um, so I did that. I mean, I would say, um, you know, my first day at Preston, um, the tutor asked us what we all wanted to do. What were our ambitions? And a lot of people wanted to be on screen. I never wanted to do that. I'm very, very happy behind the screen. Um, uh, a lot of people wanted to work on the Today programme or do this or do that. And I, by that stage, my ambition was to be a researcher on This Morning, um, which I think everybody thought was really funny, but I was just like, that's what I want to do. I love This Morning. It just started. I'm, I'm that old. And um, it started in Liverpool, and I just thought it was just such a fantastic show. Um, so whilst I was in Preston, I also went and did work experience um, uh, on This Morning as well. In Liverpool. So how did you jump from this morning? Because obviously the the, the other big show at the time was um, Anne and Nick. Yeah. Wasn't so that? Because that was, uh, we know our audience like, are, are too young to know about this. So the Anne and Nick show was the rival show to this morning. Um, and uh, uh, so as you do, when you finish, um, when you finish a, a degree or a postgrad or anything, you're applying for lots of jobs. So I applied, I applied to both, to be honest. I applied to this morning and I applied to Anne and Nick at the BBC in Birmingham. Um, and I got, the first job I got was at the BBC in Birmingham. But prior to that, I'd been working, in, you know, I used the postgrad to work in local radio. So I went back home uh, to my parents, um, again, saving money, as we all know we need to yeah. do, um, and uh, worked, freelanced at Radio Norfolk, earned some money and that was a really really valuable experience because you're you know you are sent out every day you have to get two or three stories package you know getting going back to that sort of technical know-how um doing all of that um and also thinking at the beginning of the day it's a really really um uh uh it's a really really uh you know dry news day what am i going to create what ideas have yes. i got what can i bring to the party which radio, again, radio is another brilliant example of where it's every day you go in, you have to come up with something with a beginning, a middle and end, do it, and then you hope it works, and then you put it to bed and you do something even better the next day. And, and I think there's, a, there's quite a correlation between that and morning television, isn't there? Yeah, they are. It's like it's every day you come in and it's a new day. So, you, you know, I love that. I still love that. Every day is really different. I mean, it can be really pressurized. Sometimes you do, you know, if you're every show that, you know, you work on television is pressurized at various points. In my world, you know, we come off air, we've just come off air at half past one uh, with Loose Women and we're thinking about tomorrow and people, that's what you do. It's just, that's, that's done. We hope we've done a, a really great show, um, but we're moving on to the next. It's like working in newspapers. It just continues. So obviously that tomorrow came on Anne and Nick where there was no tomorrow. So you were working there and that got axed, didn't it? Um, so what happened after that? Where did you go from there? So after that, and, and Anne and Nick was a great, I was a trainee researcher. Uh, so I, I kind of got that, I got that job, um, became a researcher and then moved up to an AP. 
Um, and then my next job and all of those skills that you learn, you know, you're learning to edit, um, you're learning to write briefs, you're learning to interview people, you're doing phone interviews with people, you're thinking of ideas um, all the time. So all of that experience was invaluable. And then my next job, I really, really loved, and I think this is a theme certainly throughout my career, and I think it is with you, Matt, as well, is that, you know, it's always about doing things and working on shows that you really love. So um, I loved GMTV, um, and, I, you know, uh, myself and my housemate used to watch it every morning. Um, we knew everything about it, and I just thought, thought I want to go to London, and I want to work on that show. Um, so I was quite tenacious. Again, went in, did work experience, got to know people, um, you know, applied for jobs, uh, got an interview and then thankfully got a job and ended up working in um, the showbiz department or the entertainment department. So each morning, as we do now on, on Good Morning Britain, um, we would have celebrity guests. So that would either be a live celebrity um, in the studio or it would be on tape. So I used to, I ended up basically making a lot of tape. But, but um, I mean, that's a dream job, isn't it? You, you, you've suddenly you've you've landed haven't you 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 you're the master of your own universe you've got to go out there and however you get it by hook or by crook you've got to get that talent story uh, so you must have felt like you you made it it was amazing but you do you're also working with incredible with you know incredible people that have that are so experienced so you also sort of feel that um, you know, you, you have those moments of, can I do it? I think everybody has that, you know, can I get in? Can I get that job? Can I get on that course? Um, so, you know, I was with really incredible, you know, journalists and really great people who were top of their game, um, who were amazing to learn from. And, um, but it was, it was thrilling. It's a really exciting, anything to do, you know, I get, you, you know this, but I, you know, the sense of anything uh, that's live and, you know, fast moving and breaking news and all of that, I just think it's thrilling. So um, to end up working there and to be able to, you know, travel and to, uh, you know, be talking about the stories that were, were happening that day or to be involved or to have to go and film with that person or, you know, that, believe me, it's not all glamorous. There's a lot of standing out in the rain, a lot of getting up at two o'clock in the morning um and all of that but you know just really really good i think we've got a clip actually of one well, of like, my yes. um first um shoots I, and, and again the, the unpredictability of, of certainly the daytime world and the media is again really exciting so i remember being asked on a friday to go to and believe me again there's a lot of times you don't go to new york with the spice girls but this is one of the times i was asked on a friday to go to Heathrow on a Saturday and fly to New York um, and, and film with them. It was a very long time ago, which you will see, because everybody looked very different. Well, they stole the show at the Brits, they've topped the charts in America, and they're hardly ever off our front pages. Yes, the Spice Girls are everywhere. They even got a mention during questions in the House of Commons yesterday. Well, GMTV caught up with the group on their recent visit to New York for this exclusive look behind the scenes. <laughs> Girls really, really do like America. It's full of mis misfits, so I fit in. It's been really hectic, but it's been good fun as well. The rest is on. This is all right, at least it's left, you know. Stylist so hates me. Nobody can understand what we're going through apart from us five, really. But the most difficult thing for us to get our head round and for our families to get our, their head round is the press. And we don't, we don't care, the press can say anything about us. They can camp outside my door, I don't care, it's part of my job, but it's not part of my parents' job. And that makes us angry because, you know, they, they didn't choose to be in this profession, they've got normal jobs, they go to the office, nine to five, do you know what I mean? So why should they have their picture t in the paper? Why should they be followed going shopping? I think it's disgusting in the British press to sort their lives out, no one wants to see it anyway, it's boring. <laughs> I probably had the easiest ride out of everybody. I mean, I haven't really got a past, you know, um, not really a hell of a lot interesting they can say about me. Or do I trust anybody? 
I'm very wary of a lot, you know, of a lot of people now, which, you know, I think you have to be like that because there's a lot of people that would like to stab you in the back. Such a laugh, we're on a good vibe. We always, you know, we always get on, and even if you do miss home or you get tired, get through it because you're always laughing. Always. I've, I mean, I don't think I've stopped laughing all this, all this um, trip. It's been really cool. So, so what did you have to do on that package? I mean, were you, so you were there, obviously. You were in, you were in New York. Yeah. So I, I went. Um, I met a cameraman there. Um, and I was basically tasked with coming back with, with three films. So at that time, the Spice Girls, they'd just sort of, they'd had their number one hit. They were, you know, um, everybody was talking about them um, and they were sort of trying to break America. I think Victoria, who looked quite different there, um, uh, had was just about to meet David then, it was that context. Um, so my job, my job as a producer was to sort of come back with the goods really, was, you know, the, it was to make as many films as I could, but minimum of three, um, and try and get, you know, as much information from them. So what I physically did on that shoot was, uh, you know, interview all of them, try and get them when they weren't being made up, when they were, when they had some downtime, you know, they were really tired, they were really jet lagged. Um, and I think I had sort of probably about 24 hours just doing various bits and pieces with them. But, um, you know, what an experience. It's fantastic. Really great. Fun. I mean, they were at the top of their game, weren't they, at that point in uh, in, in history? Yeah, and I, following and everything. It was amazing. So well, let's, what, what I want to do now is just sort of build on that, really, and and just look at what you're doing now in in daytime TV. I suppose the way to do that is to sort of look at the various roles you've had and then just try and extrapolate from that all those different aspects that I was talking about at the top that just make daytime TV so exciting and so varied in terms of what you have to do on a daily basis. So when you let, let's go right back to the beginning, when you kind of um, got your job and you went back to GMTV, and you said that you, you know, you became a deputy editor there with the responsibility for a lot of people. What, what, what is it about Breakfast TV specifically that you, that, that sort of just kept, that has kept you there really across the years? Yeah. I think, um, so, you know, being live, being, it's what you're waking up to. I just love that, um, that feeling that you, you know, you go to bed and your viewers wake up and they're waking up to a different story you know we we may have thought we were going to wake up to a new president uh, this morning where we didn't and we i suspect we won't for a while but um it's you know that's what i think is really exciting and uh, i also sort of think if you're working in the in those environments i mean it's hard people are doing night shifts you have it we have you know on gmb a fantastic team who do night shifts they come in at nine at night and finish at 9 30 the next day you know that's pretty that's hardcore um and of course when the show is on air between six um and nine each day that's when you've got to be at your sharpest and you're in the gallery um whatever your role is that's when you're on air and that's when and that's the end of your shift um so i just so lots of things really i think it's just really exciting I think there is nothing more uh, thrilling than being in a gallery when there's breaking news, when something's happening. You've got to make those decisions. You've got to know what the story is. Um, and that really, really comes with the experience. That feels like huge and frightening. Um, but everything, all those jobs that you start off as a runner or a program assistant, um, a trainee researcher or any of those jobs, you just sort of build each time. Um, so I love yeah. that. And the second love about it is that you're you know you're part of the conversation and you're you're you know kind of you know looking at what the conversation is so and setting the agenda so I really love that and I love the um that every day is different and it really is because every day is a different news day it may not always feel and, that at the moment but it but it is there's always something else to say and I want to talk to you about uh, Lorraine which is sort of the, the next step in your journey in a way because that's when you took on a an, an editor role, um, and a, so what's different about being an editor? So 
obviously it feels like there's an awful lot of experience you can gain on the way up the ladder but then now we're in a now we're in a different part of the business aren't we in a way so just explain yeah. to us what what it, what it involves so if you're if you're editing um a show like Lorraine you're in, you're essentially in charge of it so you are uh, so in my role now, I have, you know, four fantastic editors who are each running their shows. Um, and when I was doing uh, the job of editing Lorraine, so, you know, my main priorities, of course, are Lorraine herself, um, making sure uh, that she's happy with the show. We talk about content. Uh, it would be my responsibility to make sure what, what, what the content was um, about planning the show, what I thought we should be doing, um, picking up on you know, sort of cultural changes or things that, you know, our viewers are interested in. Um, so all of that, I mean, the, the headline really is it's all on your shoulders. Um, that, you know, it's you're responsible for your team. Um, you're making sure that um, they're happy, that they're, you know, that you're interviewing, that you're meeting the right people, that you're bringing the right people into the show. Um, you're pretty much responsible for the budget, for everything. And so just to give people a sense of, the difference between when you were working at GMTV, how big was that team? And then when you went to work on Lorraine, how big was that team when you were actually running your own team? What what, what sort of size teams are we talking? Yeah, so, uh, so when I was the deputy editor, so sort of a wider role over, over that show, um, probably about 100 people. And then when I went to Lorraine, it was probably about uh, sort of 30, 35 people. Um, so a smaller team, but you are, you know, it is, you're, you're running that in a, in a micro and macro way. Um, and you're, you know, in charge of the budget, you're, you're doing all of that. So um, it's sort of probably a lot more intense, really. Um, and of course, the responsibility, you know, is yours, whether, you know, the stories, everything is legal, it's compliant, um, all of those layers, really. And, and actually, I think the rain's a really good example, coming right back to the beginning about daytime and entertainment, because Lorraine's a, a show that has lots of items in it that traditionally you could say were entertainment leaning, but then at the same time, you weren't afraid on that show. Well, Lorraine still isn't afraid to tackle really hard hitting subjects. Yeah, so, so trying I to get think, the balance think, is quite. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's quite, I think it's quite, quite an opportunity, isn't it? Yeah, I think with all of our shows, they are, you know, they're topical. So it's about why, you know, my question to all the teams are: Why are we doing it today? Why is it on a Thursday, not on a Friday? Um, why are we doing it? And Lorraine herself is a is a fantastic journalist. You know, she was, you know, first on the scene at Dunblane. Um, and you'll hear more about that next year. You know, she was, she's a really, really great journalist. She's sitting on her own every morning, you know, interviewing people. It's, you know, the caliber of talent that I work with across all the shows, they make it look really, really easy. Um, and I would describe them as A-listers. They're amazing. Um, and Lorraine is a fantastic journalist and she can do any type of story. So of course she can interview you know uh, George Clooney and and Graham Norton this morning um, but she can also re tackle really really tough uh, you know uh, stories and, and one of those uh, which we decided to do on the Lorraine show was 9-11 so the 10th anniversary of that so you know again for us it's about surprising the viewer seeing perhaps um, their sort of show doing something different it's just every day you're trying to sort of reinvent. And we thought um, that a really good thing for Lorraine to do and for the show to do was to go uh, to New York um, and sort of 10 years after the horrendous events um, in on 9-11. So um, this is a, a whole program that we made on it, but we'll just say, show you a little snippet. Good morning and welcome to New York. We're here for a special programme to mark this weekend's 10th anniversary of 9-11, a day that changed the city and the skyline forever. We're going to be meeting some of the people whose lives changed that day, from firefighters to families and even children who were evacuated from their schools. But first, let's take a look back at the events 10 years ago. It began on a morning very like this one, 
and turned into a day that we must never, ever forget. And someone who was right in the thick of it was New Yorker Carol Costello. Carol was in her apartment a few blocks away, recording what was going on on her video camera. I can't even believe what I'm looking at. It just happened again. Another plane came. I think it's terrorist attack. That whole second building just fell down on itself and collapsed. I can see the smoke rolling toward my, rolling toward my windows right now. I'm filming it. I think it's going to happen. Well, Carol joins me now, and this this is the first time you've been down here, isn't it? It is. It must be really strange. It feels a bit eerie to be back down here for the first time in ten years. That day, you said it was like. It was like being on the moon. It was so alien to anything that anyone had ever experienced before. It was. It was like being on the moon. I came down from my building, and after I'd been allowed to leave my building, after the, the towers had dropped, and all of, the, all of the ash and the paper and the dust was still settling on the ground, but it was there, and it just it covered everything. It was, it was actually just a complete landscape of, of white and, and texture. And I think what was most amazing to me was the sight of the, all the emergency personnel and everything that they'd, they'd been through. Because, you know, there were firefighters and there were police officers and they were just, they were, they were literally laying all over the ground just spent from what they'd gone through. And it was also eerily quiet then, which is something that just doesn't happen in this city. I mean, New York, I've been in New York for more than 20 years, and this is the loudest place on the planet. There's never not any activity here. And that day, leaving my building after everything had happened next to this site, you couldn't hear a thing. Not even an airplane in the sky. People, people weren't even talking in loud tones. It was just unbelievably spookily and in some ways respectfully quiet very powerful very powerful how do you when you've obviously known Lorraine a long time so how how does it for you kind of she must have seen you in more junior roles and moving through uh, to now so how, how is your relationship with Lorraine and, and the other um, talent across across the morning really has, has that developed with time I'm assuming that it must be a great relationship now yeah so I mean I, I think with yeah. I think um, uh, you know the, the number one thing is that you have to prove yourself you have to be you know on screen talent have to trust you you are you know I sort of take it really seriously that you know, I'm responsible for people's careers and, um, you know, and I, and, and likewise, I think, you know, um, and Lorraine would say this, that, you know, you don't, you, you have to get to know somebody and you have to get to trust them. So, you know, uh, so certainly from a, you know, from a producer upwards, um, she has, you know, um, uh, seen me, I guess, develop and, and now doing this job. So, um, but I think it's, you know, when you're working with, with people on screen, they've got such a big job. It's, it's a real responsibility. You're giving, you need to give them the accurate information. You have to give them all the, um, you know, all the toolkit really um, to do it. So I think it's, you know, there, there can be no flippancy really. And you are responsible. It's not me sitting, you know, on a set every morning. Um, and, you know, they, as I said earlier, they make it look so easy, but it's really, really hard. They've, they've got earpieces in and people like me chatting in their ears and telling them that they've got 10 seconds to go or that, you know, or that breaking news has happened. And they have to have, they have to have people around them that they really trust, that they know can do the job. Um, so, you know, the talent relationship is really, really important. And if you're working on the show, um, you know, it's about your reputation. It's being always being really accurate with the briefs you're writing. And then, you know, and that's like, you see careers. I see people, uh, you know, move up, uh, you know, from researchers to producers or assistant producers and, or somebody's recommended them on a different show and they go off and work on something else. So it's really fantastic, but it is about, uh, you know, you know, honing those skills, um, and trust. 
and so that given that you went from being a series editor to being the head of daytime across a range of shows again what were the what were the qualities that you need for the the bigger role across lots of different talent and lots of different teams and lots of different shows yeah so that i mean you know kind of immense pressure really and um but again you know to be managing you know i in all honesty i feel like i am the viewer so i love all of these shows i've been watching them um you know most of my life um i'm fascinated in this in live television i follow all the american shows i'm you know on social i'm looking at i watch many clips every evening um from what's gone on on various shows stateside so um I think the, you know, it's, an, it's, you know, I would say it's an enormous, I've got an enormous responsibility. Um, you know, for example, this morning is uh, 32 years old, um, just gone 32 years old, I'm just adding it up now. Um, so, you know, you don't want to be the person that screws that up. And certainly I didn't want to be. Um, and I just sort of think what's really exciting about these shows is that you can, you can just keep evolving them. You can keep them moving and growing and modernizing um, and adding splashes here and doing different things. So, um, I mean, I think it's I think it's pressurized, but I mean, it's amazing to be, you know, my daily conversations with all those people that you see on screen who are fantastic. So um, I think, you know, a show like this morning, though, is, you know, it's immense. We're on air for two and a half hours um, a day now. It used to be two hours um, last year, but it's gone up half an hour. It's a lot of telly. It's got fantastic presenters um, and, you know, a fantastic team led by Martin Brazel on it. So um, I'll just show you a clip actually of something that we, that um, the team did um, probably about three or four years ago, actually, we were in our old building. Um, but again, it's kind of sort of thinking about ideas and content. And um, this was uh, an idea um, called Project 84. Um, and quite a hard subject for this morning. It's, it was about male suicide, um, and it was an it was an idea that sort of probably took about six months from start to finish to completion to or to getting it on air that worked through. But I'll I'll show it to you first, and then perhaps we can we can talk about it. Okay. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to your Monday edition of This Morning. Now, as you can see, we're starting the show outside today and that's because of a very special reason. Here at This Morning, we never shy away from stories that can sometimes be difficult to discuss and, uh, and who would doubt that one of the most heartbreaking can be the loss of a loved one to suicide. But it's the shocking truth that every single week in Britain, 84 men take their own lives. Those numbers can sometimes be hard to visualise. Well, that's why today we're unveiling 84 life-size sculptures, each representing a real man who has taken his own life in the hope that it will stop people in their tracks, make them pay attention and get them talking. Yeah, well, as you can see, there are 12 sculptures on our This Morning roof. Uh, that amount signifying the number of men who take their own life each day. Well, there are another 72 on top of our ITV building, which totals 84. The number of men who kill themselves each week. All of the sculptures will be up all week as part of a joint campaign called Project 84 with the charity Calm to highlight men's mental health and suicide prevention. They'll be made for our project by sculptor Mark Jenkins. He's uh, an American artist best known for his uh, street installations often uh, made using tape as a casting medium. The men on our roof are all made, uh, made from tape. Took 25 crew over a week to build, 100 trips up the lift to the tower, 1,500 metres of scaffolding tube, 1,150 scaffolding clips. Each sculpture uses 20 rolls of 40 metre tape. That's 800 metres for each sculpture, and it's been made possible by sponsorship from Harry's Grooming for Men, so thank you to Harry. 75% of, uh, of suicides in the UK are male. Men's mental health is some, something that we often tackle on the show with some very famous faces sharing their stories. You're having 20 pan yeah. uh, panic attacks a day. You, mm. you said you'd considered suicide. You spent two and a half weeks in a psychiatric hospital in New York. You know, so this was all consuming. Just, I just couldn't deal with the... Uh... With, with the pressure, I, and it was mainly the pressure I was putting on myself, as I've said many times before, I felt like I needed to 
be the, the best X Factor winner that, that there'd ever been. I was beating myself up. I didn't really see, I didn't have much self-worth. I was still a lost little boy and I didn't know how to cope with it. And we didn't talk for five years and the year before he ended up taking his own life, I reached out to him just before Christmas and we were meant to meet the day after Boxing Day and I lost my temper. It was the first time I'd ever really told him how I felt and I said, you know, it's not about me coming to play Happy Families. This is about me and you sitting down as adults and talking about everything that's happened and finally putting it to rest. And he started to start, and I couldn't respond rationally anymore. And that was the last words that you, you yeah, said to Yeah, until a, a Wednesday morning when my nan came into my room and said, Dad, Dad's hung himself. I can understand. Yeah. And I just wish that, and the only thing I would, I would just wish I could have spoken to him. Yeah. My identity, my, my lack of self-worth at that time, um, it brought me down to a point where I, I felt absolutely uh, useless, of no worth to anyone. I genuinely believed that, that my family uh, and the world were better off if I was dead. It, it was a decision that I'd rationalised and suicide was the logical answer. And it's such a responsibility as well, isn't it, in terms of the storytelling and, but, but in the context of a a two hour show that's got so much else in it. Yeah, so that, um, you know, as I said, that was, um, you know, we've, we've covered that story, of course, numerous times before, but that just felt a really, I mean, I think it was such a powerful way, an ambitious way of, of telling, you know, such a tragic, such a, a, um, a terrible story, but also, you know, that story, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's it was Project 84 three or four years ago. It's now, it would be 125 uh, people across a week now. So incredibly sad. That story hasn't hasn't stopped. Um, but for us, and I know that, um, you know, Philip uh, particularly, he said that was the most powerful um, story in his career that he's ever, ever been involved with and ever covered. And I just sort of think the ambition and the way that the, team that the editor and the team pieced all of that together and um you know the content it wasn't obviously just the the statues on on the roof although that was hugely challenging just you know sort of thinking about all the jobs that were involved of course there's the editorial job there's the editors and producers etc but the production management team um you know working on that project was immense because of course you know when you're putting statues like that on a building there's lots of um wind conditions etc you have to ensure that the police know about it you know just all these layers and layers and layers and the council know and you get permission etc so um you know the, the the numerous jobs that were involved behind the scenes on on sort of making that work really are immense but we still feel really to... proud of it we want to do we, we've got if covid hadn't come along we would be doing something else and we yes watch the space on that I'd like to st st stop for a minute, actually, in terms of um, the, your career and look at this morning, because I think, again, this is a masterclass. And I think this morning's a really good uh, show to sort of dig a bit deeper into what, what people do and how it works. Um, mm. So I've actually had a question in from uh, Nick Pryor that says, uh, so we're going right back to the beginning. How did you get your work experience on this morning in the first place? Um, yeah, so that's always quite hard, isn't it? Because, you know, people get, get lots of letters, lots of emails. So, um, tenacity, actually, I just, it was literally as crude as looking at who, you know, e it just, it wasn't email in those days. It was, it was sending a letter to each of the day producers so at the end of each show, there were credits. Um, and it was just sending, sending letters in and, and being, tenacious i didn't know anybody on the show i just really wanted to work on it um and eventually somebody said yes so you know i you know getting work experience i know is really it's harder and harder and i know as a company we you know you can't take um in you can't have as many people as you want in like certainly at the moment it's really hard um slash impossible but you know uh, outside of covid times it is just tenacity it's tracking somebody down and it's asking and the you know people like me would put people in, um, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, send emails on to other people. It's just, you know, it, it's finding a connection, isn't it? Being tenacious. 
well that that uh, thank you thank you nick and there you go that is there's some advice which is just look at the end credits to start with and start um yeah. uh, and and make your list of executive producers and heads of production that you can contact directly would you say that's a good yeah absolutely uh, and you tip. know change our world we have 500 people in that work in daytime it's immense it's an immense sort of landscape and yeah. you know it's sometimes just it's just it's that whole cliche thing of just getting in um and you know one week becomes two weeks becomes three weeks so um you know it, it's really worth just being tenacious and tracking down and going online and finding out who does what and doing your research actually just basically doing your research and and, and knowing the program so many people uh come in and they're not you know they have, they're perhaps not that um you know i'm not saying you have to be obsessed but it's always good to be to go and work on a show that you really love and you've got a passion for um audrey said um sent in a question as well please do keep sending in your questions and we'll try and get through as many as we can um how, what does a typical day look like at the office i'm going to say the this morning office rather than the entire uh, daytime team what 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 do they do what to how does it start sure. so um so I will, I'll, I'll try and make this as, as simple. There's so many layers to this. So there are about probably about 120 people that work on this morning. As I said, it's two and a half hours every day. So um, what happens is there's a three month ahead meeting. There's a month ahead meeting. Our world is all about planning. It's about, you know, you don't just, it sounds, you know, when I said earlier, you come off air and you're on to the next day's show that sometimes that next day show doesn't just come out of nowhere. Well, it never does. Um, it needs to be planned. So, um, but not too planned, but I'll get back to that in a moment. So, you know, we have three months ahead planning. We're looking at next year. We're looking at, we've been talking about projects for this time next year. So we work really far in advance. Um, so, and, and they don't have to be very, you know, they're not fully formed ideas, but it's, this is what we'd like to do here. That's what we want to do then. Um, so three months ahead, month ahead, week ahead, um, and then the day ahead. So if you're doing if you're doing a Tuesday show, you would come in on a Monday, you would brief Phil and Holly after the show as a producer and as assistant producer and a researcher. You would say we're doing X, Y, and Z. We've got this guest on. We're going to talk about that. I've got two gaps. I'm still not sure what what's happening because um, we try and be as topical as possible. Um, and we do that all the time. Like we're not frightened of having empty grids with, you know, that's kind of what we do really. So um, you need some building blocks, but you don't need a, a fully formed show when you go home. Um, so, you know, the day before a show, researchers would be writing briefs about their guests. Uh, the producer would be writing what Philip and Holly say or an outline um, or bullets they want to say in the script. Um, you know, the lawyer uh, and the compliance team would be checking that everything going through all the briefs. So we write a brief, a two page brief on each item that we do so that Phil and Holly or Eamon and Ruth can read it and all the facts are there, everything they need to know in a very concise way. Um, and then, um, you know, the assistant producer will be cutting the tape for that show. So any of the, you know, coming up, we've got, um, I don't know, uh, Graham Norton or somebody, they would be mm. cutting a clip of that. Um, so and who, doing books all of that. The, who books the Graham Nortons and who books your guests for the sofa? You know, like the, the, the human interest stories. How does that work? Who, who does that? Yeah, so, so there's a day team, um, a very small day team of three or four people. And then there are other departments in on this morning. So there is a news desk. So as the name suggests, they're constantly uh, booking news guests and, um, you know, for example, they booked a, a great, uh, you know, a really interesting story this morning about um, the lady who collected her mum from the care home and was arrested. So that was done, you know, last night into this morning. Um, so it can be quite last minute. So there's a news team, there's a features team. So they do everything from fashion uh, to food, um, to all the travel strands, all the travel films that you see, um, all the Alison, all the celebrity uh, films. There is a showbiz desk, so um, they look after booking um, the Graham Nortons of this world um, and, and guests for the sofa or on Zoom at the moment. 
Um, so there's lots of areas that sort of filter in to, the, to, each, to each day's show. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's the production team, the, the crew behind the scenes. So, you know, floor managers, um, camera operators, um, sound folk, um, vision mixers, directors, um, you know, it's yeah. immense. It's an immense group I, of people. I, I just... I've just had a, a, a question from Lauren. Uh, said, "What happens if something goes wrong on live television, and how do you handle it?" I mean, we haven't got time, have we, to go through all of them? Oh my God, I but I um... played a blooper tape. Um, well, <laughs> something it goes wrong all the time. If I'm honest, um, and again, that's part of the. the <laughs> I was going to say the joy. I think it's joy, um, uh, but something goes wrong. So it can be anything. It can be. You know, we've literally, um, you know, you know, 30 seconds before air, the whole gallery, so all the screens that you see have been black, you know, and there are people out with screwdrivers. It's literally like that. There are times where, you know, a, a bulb explodes in the studio. There are times when guests don't turn up or a car hasn't been sent for a guest uh, or it's gone to the wrong house or um people sleep in a lot of people sleep in in this world because of course it's breakfast and it's early mornings so, so things go wrong all the time but again in our world there's always a plan b so and that's kind of probably we're all probably adrenaline junkies that you just you really it, you, you don't mind that because if something happens and you see it on air quite a lot if 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 somebody um you know is late or they're, they're not in we go to something else or we do we go to a break or we do something else so yeah. There's always a solution and there's always a plan B. That's the, you know, every every producer and every editor has a plan B up their sleeves and C and D. I want to go back a bit to, because we've just spoken a bit about storytelling and reinventing stories and um, also just obviously reacting to the day. And, and a big part of that, which is a very big part of your job, but daytime generally is um, reacting to the news and setting a news agenda. And so I, it'd be really interesting to know more about, um, well, from a, on, your, on a personal level, the responsibility that comes with that. And also, I suppose, how, how do you set that agenda? How does that work for GMB? Um, so again, you know, it's always about having fantastically, you know, fantastic people uh, working with you. So, you know, I, I take no credit for um, uh, for what the, the GMB team are, are, you know, outputting each day because they are, you know, a great, amazing team of journalists led by Neil Thompson, the editor. Obviously, as you know, amazing on-screen talent, Piers and Susanna, um, Kate and Ben, uh, Charlotte, um, etc. So like, you know, all of that, all of those on-screen talent, amazing. Um, and then, you know, for us, it's about, you know, it is, it's, it's simple, really. It's what you're waking up to, what is going to make compelling television, what are people talking about? So we feel, I feel that across all the shows, actually. It's just, you know, if, if we're the viewer, what, what are we talking about? What's, interesting, what's interesting us? What's affecting our lives? So sometimes, it, of course, it can be a, a massive story, you know, like the US elections, um, but of course, then there's, you know, fantastic human interest stories about somebody, you know, the last nine months or eight months with COVID has, you know, really proved, proven that with, you know, Captain Tom, et cetera, you know, human interest is really important. So to cut a very long story short or, you know, two and a half hours short for GMB's case, um, it's really about you know, thinking about that mix of stories, what, you know, what's changed overnight. We always think about from when you've watched the 10 o'clock news or news before you go to bed, you know, what, what's different? How has that story moved on um, and what you're waking up to? So, you know, and again, it's, you know, if you think about what you're doing in the morning, you're waking up, you might feel a bit grumpy. You just need to know what's going on. You're in the shower, you've got one ear on the television. So you want a real mix of content. You want to know exactly what's going on. We debates are incredibly important on GMB. That really, really, you know, strong opinion, um, as well as a bit of a laugh. You know, you want some fun. You want to be, you know, um, in our case, there's, you know, as you know, with peers, there's, you know, Susanna's sitting there out outraged most of the time, you know, or or trying to balance what he's saying. So. 
um, you know, it is, it's a real mix. It's a lot of ingredients that, that go into that, but naturally it's and about, um, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, but there, there, there is a responsibility with it because you, your ITV are a public service broadcaster. So how do you weigh up impartiality and, and, and work out, you know, angles or, I'm, I'd like to ask the question as well, you know, do you, there must be some dialogue with, with people in government as well. That must come up um, because you've yeah, got such so a responsibility and an important role. Well, as you know, I think I think we're up to um, yeah, I mean, up to 190 days where we don't have um, any cabinet ministers who have appeared on the show. So I think it's day 190 from memory, um, um, and every day we do ask for them to to come on to the show. We we think that's very important. We are, as you've mentioned, a public service broadcaster. I, myself, the editor, everybody on screen, behind screen, we think. That the government should come on and talk to ITV viewers. Um, they've decided against that. So what we do now is, if they are on other shows, other breakfast shows, for example, we run a clip um, of that show or discuss what they've said on that show, and we uh, debate it and talk about it. So I think we've got an example, actually, haven't we? We can run and, and talk about it afterwards. This guy is the health secretary. To give you an indication of just how in touch Matt Hancock is, we would ask him this ourselves, mm. but it's the 50th day of the government boycott of Good Morning Britain. So there's another um, show. So we can't ask him ourselves. So we're reliant on watching the other interviews as he's doing them and then to ask follow-ups. He's just called... Uh, he has thanked uh, a footballer for driving a U-turn, a government U-turn, on 1.3 million kids. Do you know what he called him? He called him Daniel Rashford. Let's play the clip. Um, the um, Prime Minister uh, talked to uh, Daniel Rashford. He uh, considered it and made his decision. I think it's terrific. I'm, I'm in favour of uh, making sure we get as much support as possible uh, to... Daniel Rashford, that famous footballer. This is, of course, the same Matt Hancock, who he was very big on footballers. Oh, he wanted them to do their bit. Do you remember? Well, I remember, because this is what he said about footballers. Given the sacrifices that many people are making, including some of my colleagues in the NHS who've made the ultimate sacrifice of going into work and have caught the disease uh, and have sadly died, I think the last thing, the, the first thing that uh, Premier League footballers can do is make a contribution, take a pay cut and play their part. Yeah, OK, so then I asked uh, Mr Hancock in one of his last appearances on the programme, whether he would take a pay cut, whether he would do his bit, because the New Zealand Prime Minister and her cabinet had all taken a 20% pay cut, despite having the best record on coronavirus almost in the world. Here's what Hancock said. My question to you is, will you be taking a pay cut, as you urge footballers to do, and as the government in New Zealand is doing? Yes or no? Well, I'm not proposing to do that. What I am proposing to do is work every hour that there is but to try... We'd expect to... you to do that uh, with respect, Mr Hancock. This is why they don't want to come on, isn't it? Because now we'd be saying, well, OK, well, Matt, Han uh, Matt Hancock, uh, Marcus Rashford, his name's Marcus, not Daniel, and he's done his bit. He's helped 1.3 million children mm. get food this summer. What have you done? What have you actually done? Other than get it wrong on PPE, get it wrong on testing, get it wrong on shaking hands, care. get it wrong on care homes, getting it wrong on quarantine, quarantine getting it wrong about everything. Now, you're the guy who had the brass neck to stand there and lecture footballers about them doing their bit. Well, Marcus Rashford, his name's Marcus, not Daniel, has now done his bit. What are you going to do yours? That would be my question for Matt Hancock, if he had the balls to come on, which he doesn't. Day 50 of the government boycott, we don't care. Doesn't, it's no skin off our nose if they come on or not. We can sub-interview them through their other interviews, but... Pretty extraordinary, isn't it, that Marcus Rashford, single-handedly, one of the most famous footballers in the country, that he single-handedly drives government policy mm. uh, into a massive U-turn to help so many kids. And the health secretary the next morning can't even remember his name. Can't even remember his name. Think he's called Daniel. I mean, he's compelling, isn't he? <laughs> so we've had a question from Emma. Emma. Uh, how do you make sure that those debates on, on GMB 
how can you do them without them being strong, strongly offensive to anyone? How do you do that and balance it? Well, I mean, quite simply, I'm sure we do offend people, but what we endeavour to do and what we what we need to do and always do generally is is have you know a balanced side you know have two people from each side so um you know and of course Susanna is there and she is you know kind of um balancing it all um and if you were watching this morning she wasn't agreeing with with peers by um in, in any means so um so you know we have debates debates are really really important so we have you know in quite simple terms just people from the opposing sides um, and then endeavour to get that balance. You want to hear the different sides of the story. And of course, that's, you know, uh, basic journalism, but that's, you know, really important. But, you know, we have, we have you know, uh, in peers, a, a very, you know, uh, strong-minded, um, fantastic journalist. And, you know, and he is challenging and he is asking those questions alongside Susanna and the rest of the team. So, um, and we think we should be doing that. So, um, yeah, so it's about, you know the team behind the GMB team behind the scenes. You know are casting those those people to ensure that you've got somebody with that opinion and then somebody with a different opinion. Um, um, and it all makes for quite you know compelling television. Well, thank you. I I um, I'm conscious of the time, so I want to get through a couple of questions. But um, I'm hoping just from just talking through your career you can see how rich and varied uh daytime tv is and and for for people watching now i i, I really and I'm, I'm saying this personally i really do think that if you want to get into tv and want a really good grounding and a rounded view i i can't think of a better place than daytime television to cut your teeth um and we've actually got a question from um vanessa which uh, question is what qualities jump out in an application form or how can you stand out if you're trying to get into the industry? Um, well, I'm sure you, you feel the same, Matt. It's, you know, it's sort of people that have demonst you know, demonstrated that they have an interest, um, that they've sort of, you know, it's, it's very competitive. So it's thinking about how you can set yourself um, apart what can you do what experience can you get um what can you you know if you were in print journalism you'd be writing um you'd be trying to you know um uh you know uh, get articles published with us you know it's the technology has you know really advanced since i was little in telly so you know making a film editing um you know, thinking of stories are, you know, people like me and the editors and the deputy editors, you know, our currency on shows like these um, are ideas. It's all about ideas. So if you've got great ideas and if you get to meet somebody or if you get an interview, um, you know, think about what would you put on tomorrow's show? Make sure that you've watched all the shows, that you know, you know, you know what's going on, you know what's coming up, you know, how you would do something or have we thought about this it may not always be the best idea it might have been attempted but it really demonstrates that you're in tune with um that show and you know your market you know what you're you're doing think about the viewers as well who's watching that show what are they interested what are they doing what are they doing at that time of day so that's very important for us um so you know anything you can do just to um, stand out and feel a bit different from the other CVs, really, and generally that sort of experience um, and ideas. Yeah, I mean, someone someone sent me a CV once where they drawn a picture of themselves in biro in the in the top of their CV to stand out, and I was like, no, don't do that. I wouldn't do that. That's the one thing I wouldn't do. But I do think that actually you have to. Uh, if, you, if you can research and almost storytell about yourself, then that's a really good way into the industry. Because when you get into the industry, that's what you're going to be doing every day. So I, I really think that um, that's great advice. I also think that it's not, you don't, you know, you, you don't need to be a journalist. And generally, that's what I'm, you yeah. know, in, our, in my world, that's what, um, who's working here. You don't have to be formally trained. You just need to no. be inquisitive. You don't need a degree. You don't need a post grad. You don't need a great if you have, but there's yeah. not a there's not one route. Um, there's so many routes in. Um, 
so it's just worth just sort of thinking about that you know you can it's just sort of thinking about the skill set and um and it is sort of tenacity really <laughs> as well well it's competitive that competitive and tenacity um and i think that sort of sums up your your uh, career as well emma thank you so much for taking the time out today to talk to us uh about daytime and entertainment and uh, thank you to everyone for all your questions as well <laughs>